and welcome to a very special EWTN Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our guest author is Obian Yuju Ikocha, author of Target Africa, Ideological Neocolonialism in the 21st Century, published by Ignatius Press. It's a pleasure to meet you in Thank person. You. Thank you so uh, after much, After having Dad. seen so much of your work over the years and you being featured as well as on EWTN and working actually That's on right. a series uh, of programs we did out of Africa a That's number right. of years ago yes. as well. Now, usually we don't do books on ideological colonialism yeah, or yeah. neocolonialism. That's right. Tell us why this book was published by Ignatius Press and why Catholics should care. Right. So this all came at a time when uh, uh, you know, a lot of the Western countries have been putting so much emphasis on humanitarian aid, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to Africa. They are giving aid to Africa. They are talking about helping Africa. It's become a big deal. Uh, but then when you look closer, you know, on the outside, it looks like it's a great thing. Of course, it's laudable to help the poor. But when you look closer, you see that a lot of the gifts they're giving to mm -hmm. African nations and to other parts of the developing world uh, have strings, their gifts with strings attached. Mm -hmm. um, and it it then started to bother me. And, and at a pivotal moment when I had heard about Melinda Gates and the project she was doing, who is, of course, the wife of Bill Gates, doing a big project on mm -hmm. contraception for Africa. I wrote an open letter to her, and I think that's what started me on this journey, mm -hmm. where I was telling her that if she's taking $5 billion or she's raising $5 billion to bring contraceptives to women in poor countries, mm -hmm. there are other ways that this money can be used in order to set the women free and give them, you know, education mm -hmm. and, and empowerment. So many ways of doing right. that. But not contraception, so that started me on the journey. Well, did it did it strike you at the time not only because it's Melinda Gates, but Melinda Gates is a self-professed Catholic who went to Catholic school. Yeah, that actually struck me, and it was. But when I when I spoke in that letter, when I wrote that open letter, I did make mention of the Church's document in Manavite, and I said, what happens in in countries where where women, you know, believe believe mm -hmm. in this, and and women have accepted the teachings of the Church? Mm -hmm. What are you saying to women? And the reason why I put it that way is because I knew she was Catholic or she was self-professed Catholic and she was a woman who went out and spoke about her Catholic identity but mm -hmm. then still speaking about her disagreeing with the church you know she agrees to disagree mm -hmm. so I started writing and speaking about these issues and the more I wrote about it the more I thought about it mm -hmm. um, the it was all, all as, as if I was discovering more things and even mm -hmm. realizing that this was a bigger picture. It was bigger than Melinda Gates. She's part of the problem. She's part of this movement, this mm -hmm. neocolonialistic movement uh, that has started towards Africa, where they're annexing Africa, petitioning Africa. They're trying to ideologically maneuver mm -hmm. Africa to a to align with, with some of the Western values. Uh, so, you know, I, I started on the journey and, mm -hmm. and that's what got me to the to Target Africa. Well, it's interesting too, because you kind of uh, break down earlier in the book about the idea of all the different countries and how it was kind of partitioned Africa. Yes. And, you know, we don't think about it. And mostly it's, you know, France and Britain, Portugal, and mm -hmm. a little bit of Germany. But there was actually one American colonization society. Yes. So yeah. that was Liberia. Yeah, that right? was a very brief stint. Right. And that's why when I speak to Americans, I say to them, um, you, you should be upset with what is going on now because in the bigger picture of what is happening, the mm -hmm. gift with strings attached, I've talked about the neocolonialism that is happening. America is very much in the forefront, mm -hmm. but America was not a major player right. uh, in the original colonization of Africa that happened about 100 years ago. However, when you look into it, America, you know, there was a society, it wasn't the whole country, but this uh, American colonial, colo colonial society came to Liberia, right. uh, did a short stint, and left, so they left long before, yeah. long before the others. Because that was a, a, a project with the idea of maybe freed slaves yes. would, would could go That's back. That's right. And Li that Liberia and the neighboring Sierra Leone right. uh, were places where freed slaves came long before, uh, and and they were put there. That's why you have uh, you know c cities like Freetown right. who, that will be the, the land of the free. You right. know, but then the during the colonial days when colonialism happened from the late 1800s. Uh, yeah, the American Colonial Society came okay. and did what they did and, and left. Before, so when we talk about neocolonialism, I mean new colonialism, yeah. in a sense we're saying is that after World War II, basically, you yeah. kind of had the end over a period of time of, the, of what had been the formal colonial, where they were colonies, etc., from these countries. So, but though they left, yeah. and they might still be involved, in a sense what we're saying now is they're 
they want to push their values, in a sense, on their former quote-unquote colonies. Absolutely. So the first colonial days or the first colonial era, I'd say, as you had mentioned, did much towards, you know, ended around the end of the Second World War because there were all these things that were happening in the world and it was as if everything had to be reshaped and reconfigurated. Reconfig there was the Atlantic Charter that happened between the United States and, the, and Churchill. Right. And part of that agreement was that they were going to set free countries and allow countries to be sovereign and, mm -hmm. and, and you know, let themselves govern. Uh, but then that ended from the 1960s, in fact, concretely, we started getting independence. So right, right. many of the African countries will have their independence, their actual independence day around 1960, 62, 58, you know, just around then. But in the last, uh, say, 40 years, uh, which so we had about 20 years of, of, of rest. And then mm -hmm. in the last 40 years, as secularism has increased mm -hmm. in the West, as values that used to be universal values, like the sanctity of human life, you know, how people understand marriage and mm -hmm. family and human sexuality, as those are being redefined in the West, uh, the, these Western players, certain Western players and entities are coming back to Africa, mm -hmm. and they are acting in a way which is quite identical to what happened uh, you know, about 100 years ago right. in the days of the colonial. They are taking over African countries. They are trying to align African countries to them. They are right. ideologically... Uh, and what are they using to drive that? They're not doing that with military force and occupation. They're doing it with, with money? Yes, they're doing it with money, which is and even... aid, quote-unquote? Exactly, which is even more, uh, more dangerous, I would say, because at least before, the Africans knew that they were being colonized. We knew that Britain was, was ruling Nigeria. Nigeria, for example, the Britain was ruling Ghana. Uh, the Cameroonians understood that the French were in charge. But today, the African, a lot of the African leaders and a lot of the African countries still think that they are in charge. They think they have, they're suffering. But if you look closer at their budget and how these African countries are run, you would see that they are so heavily, heavily dependent mm -hmm. on the aid they are getting. Yeah, you make that point in the book. Exactly. Right. The aid right. dependency is beyond uh, what people even realize. They make up their shortfalls with Ex that. Right? Exactly. Right. A country like Malawi, I think once they had a problem with their Western donors and the Western donors punished them by removing aid and the country almost crashed financially. That is a very difficult position that for Africans mm -hmm. to be, they have become almost like addicts, you know, dependent on aid. So because of the foreign aid that, that we are depending on, uh, people who have these very strong ideologies that are almost pseudo-religious, you know, they, uh, they believe so much in, uh, for example, the abortion rights right. or, oh. or the, you know, the LGBT things, that they then tie it so closely to the funding that there is almost no way for us to, to untangle ourselves or right. to extricate ourselves from it. So, Well, uh, Robbie George actually did the forward uh, yes. to, to the book, and he said, expressive individualism is at the heart of the secular progressive worldview that now functions as the religion yes. of many Western elites, kind of like what you were just saying. Exactly. It is increasingly clear that it is a militant, evangelizing, and fundamentalist type of religion. Then he goes on to say, Western elites are willing to accomplish this goal by conditioning various forms of aid on conformity to expressive individualistic ideology. If necessary, they're prepared to use international legal institutions to attempt to coerce the quote unquote backward into compliance. Yes. It, exactly. It's this kind of bizarre paternalism that yes, they have. Yes, it is paternalism, uh, which then rolls into imperialism, you know, uh, and a lot of supremacy that goes on there. It's like, I know what is better for you, and I should tell you what you should do. But then uh, the Africans haven't asked for it. This is mm. unsolicited in every way, uh, but they still continue to do it. And the more aid they're giving us, the more they, they they embed themselves into mm -hmm. the African nations and the African, the finance, the financial situation of the African countries, uh, the more dangerous it is for us and the more difficult it is actually for African countries to stay away right. or not to be affected by, by right. what they are yeah, You the say, African I sometimes countries. think of Africa as an orphan child. What did you mean? So an orphan child who has inherited money and doesn't know it. So the Africans uh, don't understand sometimes I believe that we don't know the treasure we have. Um, Africa should not be in the situation they are now, but it's like someone, uh, 
who has wealth, who has treasure, you're sitting on it. A lot of the African countries, for example, have mineral resources. They have so many. We have we have human beings mm -hmm. who can then become resources, uh, and yet we don't realize it. We, you know, we go out begging these countries for money. You know, to make up our healthcare system, money for water and sanitation, mm -hmm. uh, money for this, that, and the other. So we are like we are like children or orphans who should right. know that we have an inheritance, but we don't know it. Right. And instead, we are living hand to mouth, like you, uh, like beggars. You talk about some of the way it, it's viewed by these aid organizations. I like guess uh, the government, in explaining its decision to other donor countries, stated family planning is an excellent value for the money. For every pound spent on family planning, governments can save nearly six pounds on health care, spending, housing, water, and other services. So that's an approach they have that yes. says, well, this is a this is a financially positive way of dealing with poorer countries. Yes, and they are speaking about saving money for themselves. So value for money is not value for money for the Africans, because some of these things, this is a statement that I have brought out from mm. the DFID, Department for International Development, which is the British organization. Right. that deals with foreign aid. But then this particular quote has been thrown around at various you know, forums and different places. Mm -hmm. They are speaking about this in this way at the British Parliament. They are doing it as presentations. So they are saying if we spend one pound on you know, family planning in the developing world, we save ourselves six pounds down the line. So for them, it's like a form of investment right. uh, or way of saving themselves money. But they are trying to eliminate poverty, or they're working on eliminating poverty by eliminating the poor, making it impossible for the poor to procreate. You say their family planning programs are the 21st century version of philanthropic racism. Yes. In which Africa is considered the quote unquote burden of the donor countries who are more interested in spending less by reducing the population than seeing themselves serving. Yes, yeah, so that's the, there was that poem uh, which I also mm -hmm. had had quoted there, the white man's burden. Right, exactly. So that the white right. man's burden, which was the poem that was very popular, it really in the heydays of of right, the, the turn of the last century. Right? That's yeah, right. right. Yeah, the, the, and that was really at the high point of colonialism. You know, in the 1900s, 1910s. Yeah, Kipling. Actually. Yeah, exactly. Right, that's right. that's Kipling's poem, and uh, the white man's burden, and the way he talked about how the white man has to go into Africa and do all these things and save the children children who are half, you know, half man, half devil, and all of that. But then today, mm. uh, even though everyone has condemned that poem, now people have said how, how terrible it was that he used those words. But today, we see from everything which is going on, the way philanthropy is happening, it is philanthropic racism, right. uh, where they are thinking about us as their burden. Mm -hmm. uh, even though some of this is unsolicited, but, uh, but they, we have become dependent on them mm -hmm. in a way with their cooperation right. or with them still, you know, making us addicted to these mm -hmm. things so that we stick ourselves to right. them and then they carry us on as burden. Well, from a Catholic perspective, one of the things that really jumps out is this uh, United States uh, USAID, I yes. guess. And, and you talk about these kind of major points that they're, that they're focused on. Contraception, yeah. legal abortion, mm -hmm. condoms will eradicate sexually transmitted disease, mm -hmm. same-sex marriage, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how that one got slipped in there. Uh, young people should be empowered with comprehensive sexual education. The yeah. traditional, this is a really important one, the traditional family structure of father, mother, and children is oppressive. Yes. So we have heard this, especially during the last or previous um, administration, you know, during the Obama administration, we saw the foreign policy become uh, rather uh, supremacist, mm -hmm. if you like, ideologically supremacist. So for those people who believe in traditional family, in traditional structure of family, mother, father, children, they found ways of saying that that is not inclusive because mm -hmm. that does not include uh, same-sex couples who decide to get children. That does not include you know, single mothers who decide to, single women who decide to become mothers. Mm -hmm. So it's um, it's ridiculous, and and that that's what we've seen. I have uh, debated on this at different places, and right. a couple of years ago, and I was done quite well. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I was in Geneva a couple of years ago, and they, the theme of that particular event was on the family. Mm -hmm. And I remember having people uh, very angry with me when I tried to describe how the Africans see the family composed really as father, mother, and children, and even right. sometimes. You know, you have grandmothers, uh, grandfathers being part of the family as multi generational right, living. Kind of these are things. Family. Yeah, this is the way we Which was much more traditional in general around the world. Exactly. And certainly in the, 
Was until the last 50 yeah. or 150 years and at least. And it matches with when the whole right. thing started to change. The moment right. the, the values started to change in the West, then they try, they've been trying ever since uh, to, to spread mm. it in almost a hegemonic manner. You know, they are right. going through the c a cultural hegemony and they're trying to spread it, they're trying to take right. it uh, from continent to continent. You say with regard to population, Africa's problem has more to do with uncontrolled urbanization. What do you mean? Yeah, so many people, uh, and who hasn't heard it, would say, oh, Africa is so overpopulated. If only we can reduce the population, perhaps since they're having so much economic problems or they're having difficulties, maybe they can manage themselves better. But I would tell you something. I come from Nigeria, and uh, the problem we're having in Nigeria is not so much overpopulation as it is that m most people in Nigeria live in about 12 or 13 major cities. Mm -hmm. So a, a city like Lagos or a state like Lagos State, which is one of our, I think, 36 states, is only about less than 0.5% of the land mass of mm -hmm. Nigeria, less than 0.5%. And yet every one in 10 Nigerian lives in Lagos. So 10% of the country right. lives in a very tiny piece of in land. Less than 1% of the of land. Of the land. Right, right. So what has to happen or what should happen that would be good for a lot of the African countries would be if governments would put money to develop the country all around so that how people live in the West, you can live in a small rural area and still have everything you need in life. Uh, they should do that right. in a lot of the African countries because in most places, if you're living in the rural area, you might not even have electricity or water mm -hmm. or, you know, or just basic amenities. And people are naturally going to places where they can, and those are the cities. Sure. And by the time you know it, it's like most people in that region have concentrated themselves in this one small city in Nairobi or Kampala right. or Lagos, and thereby making it overpopulated areas, right. but it's not, the, it and, doesn't and mean from, the country. from an image perspective, that's what people see, that's these teeming see. masses, so to exactly. speak. Exactly, and right. your land, when you land in a country, you land in, in Kampala, you land, mm. land in Entebbe, uh, you are driving through you, this, this capital city, and you are thinking, oh, so many people. But when you go into the rural areas right, and some realize, villages, right. there's no one there. There's, you know, there's hardly anyone in my village, you know. So my parents live with a few people, but then when you go into the cities, there's so many right. people. Uh, so the, the, it should just be a, a reorganization of the countries. We have right. a problem of urbanization and the, just how slums right. form, and the slums are forming in these areas where there's so many people. But right. it's based on that kind of concentration uh, of, um, of residency that right. they are basing their policies on sure. contrast perception and, and, you know, right. yeah, things like Those that. Those are the images that work for them. Yes. This, this was interesting. With all the challenges and difficulties of life in Africa, there's much to complain about. And Africans, like many other people, lament their problems openly. Mm -hmm. Throughout my life, I have heard people complain of many things that I have never heard a woman complain about her baby, born or unborn. That's right. So I have, I have, uh, of course, born and, have been born and bred in Africa, uh, in Nigeria particularly, and, and I, I never once until the day I wrote this, which was part, this was actually part of the original open letter to Melinda Gates that I wrote in 2012. I had never heard anyone say, oh, I wish I didn't have these seven children. I wish I had three. My life would have been better. You know, instead a woman would complain about you know, money for education for her children, or they don't have books, or they don't have, but never do you hear them say, oh, perhaps maybe a few children could have been better for me. Mm -hmm. So m most times, you know, at least in, in most of the cases that I know of, people are always very grateful and glad for their children because the Africans see children literally as blessings from God. Uh, and it's, you know, in an unashamed way, uh, children are directly translated, you know, as, as God's precious right. gifts. And never do you hear people say, oh, yeah, maybe we should have had less children. Right. Yeah, but the world then looks at Africa. Yeah, because even I think you use uh, some of the language in the sense of blessing and That's how right. it's always very positive. Yes. Life is such an important thing. That's and, right. How children right, are named right. uh, will, will already tell you, right. even by the name, you know, the traditional name that right. uh, they are a blessing to, to their right. families. Well, you talk about African Catholic women tend to highly regard Pope Paul VI's encyclical Humanae Vitae. Yes. African women, in all humility, have heard, understood, and accepted the precious words of the prophetic Pope. Women with little education mm -hmm. and material wealth have embraced what the average Vogue and Cosmo reading woman in the United States has refused to understand. Right. That when six marriage and children are separated, promiscuity, divorce, abortion, prostitution, and pornography spread as never before. And the problem that's always somewhat 
you know, you'd stymie you when thinking about this yes. is at a time when some of this was being proffered, people didn't see the results. Now the results are clear. You yes. would think intelligent people of the level of a Gates or a Ford Foundation would have the understanding enough to realize this isn't working. Yeah, Why exactly. don't they see it that way? Well, since 1968, we should have seen that Humana Vita was prophetic, if nothing else, right? That, that women are always better off when they are in, in loving marriage relationships with their husbands and contraception is not introduced and they are able to live out uh, their, their lives happily and, and welcome children and be open to life as God will have them. But, um, but the people who have all the money just don't see it that way. Mm -hmm. The thing is that they have been schooled in this particular ideology mm -hmm. they are so faithful to the ideology if I can put it that way mm -hmm. as one would be faithful to a particular religion that that's all they see right. and because that's what they, that's all they see they try then to to impose it on others through their money they would say they're not really forcing anyone but then when you bring in two million dollars into a small place where there is uh, where, where there is no money mm -hmm. then you are really going to be imposing it right. because a lot of things will change on the force of the money you're right and in. that's where you have that kind of idea of the the uh, the addiction yes to that that's which you talk about uh, later in the book, and yes. you also talk about the hypersexualization of youth. Yes. And, and this is interesting. Why do you think the UN is so interested in this? It is very confusing to me as well. You know, I grew up uh, being raised to, to respect the United Nations because mm -hmm. we always took it that they were the great arbiters of, of morality right. and they had such a moral voice and they were the human rights example and all whatnot. But in the last couple of years, I have had a lot of dealings with the United Nations. In fact, next month, I will be at the United Nations and part of what I'll be doing will be speaking about this book. But the UN, I find, is that even though they are a group of, they are the group of nations, they are the United Nations, but then I still believe that they have, as a as an organization or as an institution, they are, they are more aligned to the most liberal or the most progressive Western countries. Mm -hmm. So even though it is the United Nations that has all the countries and they're supposed to be equal and sovereign nations making up this institution, yet when you get in there and see how things are run, you would see that the most respect will be given to the wealthiest countries. Mm -hmm. And the wealthiest countries, of course, are these Western countries. And of course, uh, someone like the Gates or, or the, you know, uh, the Ford Foundation, Ford Foundation. Those, right. those individuals who are philanthropists and who have so much money are very much respected uh, within right. those circles. So the UN does everything or most things in order to align properly with, well, because, uh, with, with some of the Western I'm, countries. I'm assuming their organizations are benefiting from those organizations Yes, because at they, the same they are time. funded. They have all these agencies right. like UNFPA that I write quite a lot about in the book. Right. Uh, even organizations like UNICEF have, have also so uh, become agents, you know, right. they, they are the ones, yeah, way, they're right. the ones who go out and propagate some of these horrible things to children, talking about, you know, giving condoms right. to very young and children. And they like to have wonderful names like Global Fund for yeah. Women, <laughs> Mama Cash, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, things like that. And, yeah. and again, with some of them, some of the organizations like Gates or Ford might do some other good work in other areas. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, and then, uh, by the way, we're dealing with overpopulation. And I would yeah. wonder also in dealing with that, has that been focused in a sense being exacerbated with the whole uh, you know, global warming and global mm -hmm. climate change? Because some people, when you boil it down, yes. a lot of times it gets down to population control is what right. they're really talking about. Because yeah. if the people are the ones polluting, well, you can make them pollute less, but another way to make them pollute less is not have as many of them. Right, so Doug, I believe that this whole thing, the whole thing that we've been talking about has become a convergence for people with different interests. So at the end of the day, they are doing the same thing. They're going out and they're ideologically trying to colonize everybody they are trying to to get people in the developing world and all, you know and beyond even but it is a convergence, and that's mm. why they are forming such a strong movement. I believe that the people who have come together are very environmentalists, people who care so much about the environment to the point that it's almost like a religious. Religion for them too, yeah. right. So it's, you know, almost fanatically uh, en en environmentalist uh, minded people. Mm. Then there are the people who are more the population control, people mm. who have come from the mindset of Paul Ehrlich. Um, and, and right, the, uh, Thomas Malthus. Exactly. So these are the, the children or the students of Malthus. And they're still right, living out right. that, even though that has been completely debunked. There's yeah. also another part of that movement, which will be the people who care only about feminism. Mm. So they are radical feminists. 
feminists who have been uh, holdouts from the second and third wave feminism that happened in the West, but they want that all globalized. What they have managed to achieve and 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 propagate as feminism in the West. They want that to be all over the place. Uh, Canada just recently put money to promoting feminism in the developing world. Mm -hmm. So they are even coming to African countries and they're trying to form organizations that would change uh, the way women see themselves and the way women women appreciate family and things like motherhood. Mm -hmm. So this has become a convergence. Right. And then there's, of course, the abortion rights people uh, and, of course, the LGBT people. So it's a, a whole convergence of people. And, and of course, the environmentalists are part of that. that sure. We're just about out of time. How long did it take you to write this book? And is this your first book? It is my first book, and it took me exactly uh, seven months to write seven it. Seven months to write. Yeah. Okay. Well, we hope uh, you get time to write another book down the road. I hope well, so thank too. you so much for thank stopping by. Thank you for by, having me. We'll get you on the show. Thank you very Obi -Wan much. Obi Uju Ikocha, author of Target Africa: Ideological Neocolonialism in the 21st Century. There's a lot of Catholic ideas in this book, published by Ignatius Press, available through our EWTN Religious Catalog. EWTNRC.com, and it's an important book for Catholics to understand. Thank you for joining us here on this special bookmark. See you next time.